7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and lift off. Welcome to the 23rd Advanced Maui Optical Space Surveillance and Technologies Conference presented by Maui Economic Development Board. Please welcome President and CEO Leslie Wilkins to the stage. Thank you so much. May I just say, wow. <laughs> Aloha and good morning, everyone. And welcome to a record-breaking Amos Conference, now in our 23rd year, and experiencing astronomical growth on all fronts, from global attendance within this ballroom and beyond, to partnerships with our sponsors and exhibitors, and to the technical contributions by our authors and presenters. As is customary for our annual gathering, we invite our dear friend, and he has the title actually of our official Amos chaplain that is given as a term of endearment. Um, please welcome Kahu Alika to establish a Hawaiian sense of place with an invocation to honor our responsibilities to the life of this land and its people and to set the tone for this week's discussions. Kahu? That rocket ship at the beginning was pretty amazing, actually, before takeoff. Now, you know when you get on the airplane and you're about to take off, they'll say, please put your cell phones on airplane mode. So if any of you are looking down, Got to look up here, yeah. <laughs> oh, ho na na ikahala, me kalehua, e hie halalehua, o ia na kanohe. Oh, ho ka uno ia, e ano ine, e ali ane, ho io kahiki mai. Hiki mai no o ko, a hiki pū no me ke aloha, aloha e, i e, aloha e, i e, aloha e, i e. Vilina me ke aloha i au ko i ke ia kakaiaka. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha and good morning to, to you all. Uh, whether you are kama'aina, born and raised here in Hawaii, or a malahini, someone who moved to Maui and grew up here, or have recently become a resident, or if you are a newcomer visiting our island for the first time, or among the 200 plus folks that are joining us virtually, welcome to the 23rd Advanced Maui Optical and Space Surveillance Technologies Conference. So I am grateful to Sandy Ryan, who's the conference organizer, and to Leslie Wilkins for the invitation to be with you this morning. I remember I reminded Sandy three years ago when we gathered here in 2019, the year prior to the pandemic shutdown, that I'm not one who is inclined to simply say, let us pray 
and then be on my way. So I will take a few moments, maybe more than a few, of your time to invite you to consider your work and the work that is being done here on Maui and in the larger context of the world in which we live. Over the years, our gathering has been marked by significant events in the world and beyond. Some of us were here in the aftermath of 9-11 when the conference was initially canceled and then reopened a few days later when we realized all the airports were shut down and no one was able to leave Maui anyway. <laughs> we were here in 2013 following the death of Senator Daniel Inouye the year before, remembering that his support, remembering his support for your work. We were also here after the summer demonstrations against the construction of what is now known as the Daniel K. Noe Solar Telescope. And we were also here after the fall demonstrations that same year against the construction of the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Awakea. We were here in 2021 as a consequence of the COVID pandemic, uh, but here virtually. And we are here today, a few days after, NASA's DART mission, uh, I guess, crashed into an asteroid deliberately. <laughs> so, there's a lot going on. So our gathering here this morning comes amidst other developments. The National Sciences Foundation's Daniel K. Noe Solar Telescope began its first scientific observations uh, at the beginning of this year. In a press release that was issued in February, the foundation pointed out that the telescope was over 25 years in the making. Today, it is the world's most powerful solar telescope that is now poised to revolutionize our understanding of the sun and its impact on the earth. The construction of the solar telescope on Haleakala has not been without controversy. The same may be said about the construction of the 30 meter telescope on, on Mauna Aokea on the island of Hawaii. In May of this year, our state legislature passed a bill to establish a board that will oversee the stewardship, management, and human activity on Mauna Aokea. The management of the mountain, currently under the university, will be transferred to an 11-member board that will include Native Hawaiians, educators, the mayor of Hawaii County, and other stakeholders. Many, if not all of you, have been aware of demonstrations against the construction of both telescopes. Some in the media and others in the community view the demonstration as a protest against scientific research and knowledge. But others, leading the demonstration on both islands, saw themselves as ku ki'ai, not as protesters, but as protectors of both mountains. The ku ki'ai and many others are concerned not only about the management by the university or others, but they are also concerned about the stewardship and care of the aina or land upon which the telescopes have been built. A year ago, or a year has gone by since we were last together, I want to leave you with a thought I shared previously when we gathered in 2019. While I was living in California from 1979 to 1991, I became a member of a halau, a hula school. I danced hula for six years, but at 73 years old these days, it's really hard to dance. <laughs> but anyway, my kumahula teacher uh, was here recently, uh, earlier a few weeks ago, and she composed a mele or song that asks three questions. First, where is your mountain? Second, what is your river? And third, how did you come here? I was born and raised on the slopes of Hualalai, one of the four mountains that make up the island of Hawaii. There are no rivers where I grew up, but there is, is the vast expanse of the blue ocean waters off the Kona coast. And I've lived on 
Maui now for 31 years in Wailuku. And thankfully, there's a river there, Wailuku River. Uh, I came to Maui when I was called to serve a congregational church in McKenna, not far from where we are. Hualalai, like Mana Awakea, as well as Haleakala here on Maui, and all the mountains of Hawaii, and all the mountains in the world from the places that you, you have come are sacred and storied places. If you know where your mountain is, the place where you were born and raised, and if you know what your river is, what sustains your life, you will know the answer to the third question. How did you come here? Or what is it that brought you to this time and place here on Maui, on the slopes of Haleakala? I encourage you to ask that question of yourself again, or for the first time. And I also encourage you to ask each other in the moments when you are about those questions. I know it may seem like a bit of an indulgence since science is about observation and the facts that we glean from observations. But beyond what we do, what we see, what we observe, it is equally important to know who we are, the places we were born, where we were born, and the cultures that nurtured us. And to know that like the mythic story of Maui, who lassoed the sun to slow its trek across the sky every day for the benefit of humankind, so may your work and collaboration on space situational awareness and space domain awareness be of benefit to others. Whatever your religious or spiritual commitment or cultural tradition may be, we gather here as people of goodwill. You may be celebrating the new year, or you may have family in Florida or Cuba or in Laos and Thailand and Vietnam, or being affected by a hurricane and a typhoon. But we gather here, yeah, again, as people of goodwill. So this Lao Ki, the tea leaf, for the blessing, is a symbol to keep you safe in your coming and going as you travel to this place and as you return to your homes. The vai, or water, comes from Wailuku River. It's a symbol to clear the way for your time together. Uh, so, May you grow not only in knowledge, but also in wisdom in your time here together. Knowledge and wisdom, and to know the difference, yeah? May I ask this? Yes, this is my assistant. We always do this every year. Yes, we're Watching out for the screen. <laughs> All right, push. <laughs> I mean, I would do this, but... Maybe if we kill the clock, that might be okay, but not the screen. <laughs> or the clock? Well, it says three minutes. If it... I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Amos 2023. And um, since Leslie's working so hard. Okay, I'm not. Thank you so much. Oh, Leslie thinks I'm done. I'm not. <laughs> so, what I want to leave you with, and it, it is part of the blessing. If you want to know about the places, the food, the art, the music, and the dance of Maui, please, please. Don't ask Google. <laughs> ask Leslie, ask Sandy, ask the Amos conference team staff, uh, ask the staff and employees of this uh, resort. Because if you do, then what will happen is you will meet the people of Maui, which is what makes this place even more special. Aloha e, aloha e. Aloha. E. Aloha.
Thank you, a heartfelt mahalo, Kahu. We appreciate the message of responsibility that you've continued to share with the Amos community since its inception. And thank you for the special blessing. I much I need it this week. Thank you. Very special. Now that we have paid tribute to where we are, let's take a look at who is here. So we are delighted to see the international presence of Amos continue to grow with nearly 200 of you joining us in person and online from 23 countries, including our neighbors in the Indo-Pacific region, as well as Europe and Central America. Whether it's in the resort lobby or the privacy of your room, and it is your link to asking presenters questions throughout the program. As we look ahead to a productive week involving the strategic and exploratory discussions amongst a diverse cross-section of academia, government, military, and industry in the realm of space situational awareness, we would like to recognize that we are navigating unprecedented growth with, are you ready for this? 1,203 attendees joining us here on Maui and an additional 248 viewing the live stream. This year's attendance mirrors the growth we've seen across the global space economy. It is a challenge that we humbly accept and with our team's mantra of doing all we can, the best we can, we have established measures to help you make the best of your time with us. Thank you for being here. There are a number of viewing options for the times when the ballroom is at its capacity, which is definitely this morning. An overflow room is available downstairs during the keynotes, SSA policy forums, and morning technical sessions. In addition, the conference mobile app and the virtual platform give you the flexibility to join us from wherever it is most convenient for you. In response to this record-breaking volume of technical submissions received this year, and with physical poster space at capacity, the new virtual poster category was created as an inclusive opportunity our Amos authors can enjoy and can interact with you. With the addition of over 60 virtual posters, this year's Amos is the largest body of scientific work and cutting edge research yet, allowing for abundant technical exchange by a greater number of in-person and online attendees. To bring further recognition to our poster presenters, this year we are debuting a new facet of the poster sessions. With the help of our poster chairs, in-person poster presenters will have the opportunity to briefly pitch why you should stop by their posters, helping you connect with the research most critical to you. Three prizes have also been awarded, so look for those blue ribbons, to the in-person poster presenters, one of which guarantees an oral presentation slot for Amos 2023. Stop by the poster and exhibit hall to find out who those winners are. Another new dimension, an exciting debut at Amos this year, is the inaugural Women and in Allies in SDA event, happening tonight from 8 to 10 p.m., honoring women and non-binary individuals of the space sector, joining us for dancing, desserts, and networking under the stars. Thursday's keynote presenter, Izain Uzo Okoro, will share brief remarks as we celebrate the growing diversity within the space industry. Separate registration is required and is limited to the first 300 individuals. Last but not least, we want to recognize the individual companies and other organizations who have made the 23rd Amos Conference possible. 
With their support, we have been able to continue to develop our hybrid infrastructure to accommodate further growth. First of all, let's begin with our Malama level. Advanced scientific concepts, the Aerospace Corporation, Astro Haven, Blue Canyon Technologies, Celestron, Cloudstone Innovations, Geost, Japan Space Forum, Keihan Space, Lipoa Maui Innovation Community, Lasas Tech, Plane Wave Instruments, Rocket Communications, Sierra Nevada Corporation, Turan Orbital, and Toptica Photonics. Thank you. Next, let's celebrate the Kapua'a level. General Atomics, John Hopkins Applied Physical Laboratory, Physics Laboratory, Linquist, and Space Map. Next, at the Lokahi level, we thank AWS Aerospace and Satellite, Ball Aerospace, Exo Analytic Solutions, Raytheon, Secure World Foundation, and Space Foundation. At the Laulima level, CACI, ComSpock, Kratos, Leo Labs, North Star Earth and Space, Paraton, Slingshot Aerospace, and SpaceNav. At the Kakua level, our deepest appreciation to KBR, L3 Harris, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Privateer Space, and SAIC. And finally, at the Po'okela level, mahalo to the Boeing Company for their continued partnership as our top sponsor. We appreciate the support Boeing provides as a longstanding pillar in Maui's technical community. With their ongoing investment in the local STEM workforce, pipeline, as well as leading the charge of the next generation of space leaders as the lead sponsor for Emerge In. Let's give them an applause. <laughs> Our exhibitors are available in the exhibit venue as well as online in the virtual platform. Visit them to learn about the latest offerings. On Friday, get ready for some noise and some energy as we welcome 150 middle school students and their STEM educators from Maui, Lanai, and Molokai. They will descend upon us and the exhibit hall for hands-on learning activities with select exhibitors who are very brave, thank you and a great opportunity. They are going to meet astronaut Scott Scooter Altman. A handful of Amos sponsors have also elected to help further by providing some hands-on activities. Uh, we're very grateful because you are contributing to Maui Economic Development Board's growing the next generation of STEM professionals, your future innovators and workforce. Many of you have chosen to be generous and donate to MEDB's Kalahele Fund, um, which is private contribution to support um, STEM education. Also, many of you are joining us as members, which we welcome. You can visit medbpathways.org to learn more. Mahalo for helping us create engaging experiences and opportunities for our island youth. While in um, inspiration might spark in the classroom. Our fifth annual Emergent program targets young professionals and students passionate about space by providing professional development, mentorship, and networking. A joint initiative of Amos and the Space Generation Advisory Council, also known by SGAC. This year's Emergen welcomed 48 young space professionals, half of whom call Hawaii home and the rest that call the continent or even international um, destinations joined us for a collaborative immersive opportunity. It was a two-day experience 
anchored by an Artemis-centric hackathon sponsored by Millennium Space Systems, which is a Boeing company, as well as Cahan Space and Trusted Space. Members of the 2022 cohort will provide a briefing on their activities tomorrow morning. You don't want to miss this at 11.20 a.m. here, Hawaii Standard Time, followed by a featured presentation by Emergent member and 2022 Student Award winner, Michael Klonowski. Continue with our thank yous. We want to recognize the 269 authors who submitted abstracts this year, another record-breaking number, and to 228 presenters who have traveled near and far and virtually to share their areas of expertise with you. We also want to thank our session chairs, uh, many of, you, of whom are returning veterans, thank you, for their continued support and leadership, as well as their stewardship of the conference's technical credibility. With their unfailing experience and guidance, we thank our conference co-chairs, Paul Kirvin and Darren Nishimoto, who are seated here in the front row, who helped us navigate our most successful call for papers yet. Would the two of you please stand and be recognized? Darren Paul. Thank you. A very important partner of the Amos Conference and Maui's innovation sector is the U.S. Space Force and Air Force Research Laboratory. Commander Lieutenant Colonel Philip Wagenbach, would you please stand? And finally, we want to thank the Wailea Beach Resort, our host for this conference, for their gracious hospitality. For 22 out of our 23 years, we only took a little sabbatical from this property when they were under major construction for one year. They have adapted in a very big way to our ever-changing needs and have recognized that by hosting Amos, they themselves are investing in an initiative that impacts Maui's economy and the livelihood of our community. Every year we ask for your feedback as we shape the following year's conference. Printed forms were included in your conference bag and can be accessed digitally through the mobile app and the virtual platform. Planning for 2023 begins literally this Saturday. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Victoria Sampson, the Washington Office Director of Secure World Foundation. We are grateful for our continued partnership with Secure World, and we look forward to three days of dynamic keynotes and SSA policy forum panels. Thank you for your continued partnership with the Amos Conference. Good morning, everyone. Um, it, as was introduced, my name is Victoria Sampson with the Secure World Foundation. It is my honor to um, introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Lieutenant General Michael Goodline is Commander, Space Systems Command, headquartered at LA Air Force Base. He is responsible for approximately 10,000 employees nationwide and an annual budget of 11 billion, managing the research, design, development, acquisition, launch, and sustainment of satellites and their associated command and control systems. His extensive portfolio includes military satellite communication, missile warning, navigation and timing, space-based weather, space launch and test range, space superiority, responsive space, and other emerging evolutionary space programs. Lieutenant General Gitline was commissioned through the ROTC program at Oklahoma State University in 1991. His acquisition experience spans air and space capabilities and systems across special operations, global power projection, missile warning and detection, and counter space mission areas. The general has commanded and led the flight, squadron, division, directorate, program executive officer, and field command levels. 
Notable assignments include serving as the Director of Remote Sensing Systems, Commander, Rapid Reaction Squadron, the Military Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, a Secretary of Defense Corporate Fellow, and a Program Executive for Programs and Integrations at the Missile Defense Agency. Prior to his current position, Lieutenant General Goodline was the Deputy Director, National Reconnaissance Office, where he acted as a senior advisor to the director on all military matters and in managing strategic and tactical operations of the NRO. In this position, he was dual-hatted as the commander of the Space Force element, responsible for managing all Air Force personnel and resources assigned to the NRO. And with that biography, I'd like to welcome General Goodline to the stage. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I don't need that. That'll just get me in trouble. I do need water. Okay. I greatly appreciate you guys inviting me here this morning. This is pretty exciting. Um, I love Hawaii, and uh, I, I cannot complain about being here. Uh, Kahu, thank you very much. I, I don't see you out there. You may have left, but thank you for uh, that wisdom and that blessing. Uh, that's one of the highlights of me of always uh, starting one of these meetings here in Hawaii is that traditional blessing and traditional prayer. Uh, so I greatly appreciate that. I do want to have a few shout outs. Uh, Leslie, thank you for inviting us here uh, today to, to talk about what's going on in the world, talk about some of the exciting things we're up to, uh, etc. I want to give a shout out to Sandy Ryan. Uh, Sandy has made sure I've gotten from point A to point B all week, and I have not been late. So Sandy, I greatly appreciate that. You've been a phenomenal host. I know it takes a tremendous amount to pull this off, so thank you. Uh, I greatly, greatly uh, appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank Victoria for that introduction. You made me sound a heck of a lot uh, taller than I really am. I almost feel like I get to get a step stool up here to kind of <laughs> raise myself up on a, on a pillar. Uh, I do, before I start, want to ask everybody, please keep the, the men and women of uh, Florida in your uh, thoughts and prayers as uh, Hurricane Ian uh, has hit uh, the uh, coast about an hour ago. Uh, it, is, it is just two miles an hour short of being a Cat 5, so that's pretty significant. And I think uh, if you are here from Hawaii, our thoughts and, or here from Florida, our thoughts and prayers are with you. And if you're at home, our thoughts and prayers are definitely with you as you uh, ride out this storm. So if you know me, the first thing I always do is start with talking about the why. Uh, my mom says when I grew up as a little kid, I kept walking around the house at two, year olds, two years old and always saying, I know why, I know why, I know why. And my mom would ask me, what do I know? And I'd just say, I know why. <laughs> I, I can tell you today, I know why. I know why we're here. We are here because of the threat. Um, I always start one of these uh, conferences talking about the threat, not because I want to admire the threat, but because we have to counter the threat to ensure we continue to use space for peace and for defense. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I could come up here and say the threat is getting better, but the threat is only getting worse. Over the last year, China exceeded the US in a number of space launches for the first time in history. October 27th of last year, they launched a new satellite into a geo-orbit unannounced about what the purpose of that was, and Exoanalytics, I think we have a few of them in the room, were tracking that satellite and determined that that was actually a robot sat as they grabbed one of their defunct satellites, towed it out into the disposal orbit, and then rapidly came back to where they started. Clearly a new capability uh, that shows their advance and their, their advancement and their intent. February of last year, they launched a uh, new satellite around a new orbit around the moon that we had never seen before uh, without uh, explanation of what the purposes are but it is clearly a new capability because they immediately on social, net, on social media posted a picture on the back side of the moon looking at the earth in the far distance. Uh, clearly, clearly something of concern. Uh, Chinese aggression is on rise in the east and, and south China seas as China continues to pursue their Silk Road initiative, by the, by the way, which has extended all the way into the Arctic now. So they are going after the national resources that we all kind of hold precious and the environmental, uh, the, the, the last pristine set of environment that we have on Earth. Last month, the Speaker uh, of the House went to uh, Taiwan 
in Chinese, uh, though China showed a level of force and, and exercise that we've never seen as they proved that they could absolutely counter the Taiwanese Navy and the Taiwanese uh, uh, Air Force. But it's not just China that we've been concerned about, it's also Russia. Uh, last uh, uh, July, Russia began the, the, the construction of a new uh, anti-satellite complex in mobile laser that complements their mobile laser dazzler system. Last November, everybody in here is aware, because this is an SDA conference, that they launched an anti-satellite at one of their at, at an satellite missile system at one of their satellites, blew that uh, that satellite into a th couple thousand pieces, 800 of which are still in orbit, raising the number of objects that we are trying to track and deconflict uh, in excess of 46,000. These behaviors are clearly unsafe and unprofessional at best. But I wish he could tell you it stops there, and it doesn't. Uh, we're also worried about North Korea and Iran. They have showed new aspirations for launch, new aspirations for space, and we are closely monitoring them. It is just a matter of time until someone breaks from international norms and starts to threaten sovereign territory. All you have to do is look at the activities that are happening in Ukraine. Why should we care? I would just ask you to take 10 seconds to imagine your life without GPS. How would you get from point A to point B? How would you use the ATM? How would the ambulances get to the patients and to the hospital? How would we get cargo off the ships and to the, to the uh, grocery shelves? We could not do any of that without GPS. 10 minutes without GPS would be absolutely catastrophic around the globe. History's toughest battles have occurred at the nexus of ambition and desperation. When one or more parties violate international norms and upset the status quo out of fear of not being able to achieve their aspirations. There's a new book out there that I would ask everybody to at least take a look at called The Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China by Hal Brands and Michael Beck Beckley. It's not all about the military. They postulate that that perfect storm could be coming as soon as 2025. At SSC, Space Systems Center, Space Systems Command, I talk about the 2026 threat. If you talk to the secretary, he's talking about 2027. If you look at what we were talking about a couple years ago, it was 2030. Now we're talking 2025. That threat is here, it is here today, and is at the nexus of ambition and desperation. And why do we say that? China's economy is starting to dwindle. Because of the one-child policy, they have more personnel now exiting the workforce than they have entering the workforce. And they have an aging population that they're gonna to struggle to take care of. Couple that with them trying to secure the dynasty that they've built up for the past 12 years, and we could see conflict come at the edge of, or at the nexus of ambition and desperation. That's what keeps us awake at night. In order to deter the threat, we have to have overmatch. Today, I can stand up here and tell you without a shadow of doubt that we have overmatch, and we must keep it that way. But the threat is proving themselves intent on changing that status quo. However, as Kahu said, I ask everybody to consider your work, because it's not all doom and gloom. There's an enormous amount of excitement going on out there. The threat isn't the only thing that has changed over the past three years. There's been a lot of positive change as well. We as a community are great at being our own worst critics, and I will admit we are nowhere perfect, but we are a lot better off today than we were a year ago, and we'll be a lot better off a year from now than we are today. Not only are we our own worst critics, but we also spend a lot of time admiring the problem and identifying all the reasons why we can't and why we won't and why that doesn't work, et cetera. Today, I am asking you all to take credit for what you have accomplished. Commit to stop admiring the problem and get after the threat through innovation, unity of effort, and an absolute sense of urgency. In December of 2019, we stood up the United States Space Force. Uh, in December, it will be three years old uh, this December. We are, without a shadow of doubt, the world's greatest space force, created by the world's greatest air force, supported by the world's greatest industry and the world's greatest set of allies. That is a massive, huge, powerful combination. Together, we can accomplish anything. As scary as a threat is, the real excitement is that everybody in this room has been a part of in transforming the use of space. 
take a pause and look back where we were three years, three years ago, just three years ago, and look at where we are today, and we saw some of it up on the video screen. I have seen an unprecedented level of unity of effort that I haven't seen in my 31, career, 31 years in uniform. We have a Space Acquisition Council sitting at the top inside the Pentagon now trying to coordinate across all the services. We have a Program Integration Council looking across all of the acquisition community, whether you're in the IC or in the DOD, and trying to organize ourselves around unity of effort, deconflict what we're doing. We're now having field comm summits, something I haven't seen in my entire career, where all three Space Force field commands get together and talk about how we're going to go at the problem together, rather than each individually pedaling separately and worrying about rice bowls. But it doesn't stop there. We are having unprecedented levels of interaction with our allies. 23 countries dialed in here today is awesome. Three years ago, we weren't even talking to our allies about very much. We weren't allowed to by space policy. The handcuffs aren't off yet, but they sure have loosened up, and those conversations are absolutely critical. And it doesn't stop with our allies. We're also talking to our industry partners at unprecedented levels. Over the past six months, we've had what we call industry days and the reverse industry days, where we have met over 1,000 people and several hundred com uh, uh, companies one-on-one -on -one to understand what we are trying to do, understand what they can bring to the table, and asking for their advice and input on how to change the way we're approaching the problem. Today, we have more capability on orbit than we have ever before, and there's more coming. We have more partnerships with our allies. Space is booming both scientifically and economically. Today, we are connecting the globe in new and unimaginative ways that has never before been possible, thanks to the likes of companies like SpaceX, Amazon, OneWeb, et cetera. We're reaching folks that have not been able to, to uh, be connected in the history of man and suddenly we're doing that from space. Not only that, but we've now moved into crewed flights, right? We, we had taken a hiatus from the United States launching when, once we stood down the space shuttle. Within the past two years, we've gone back to launching manned space flights. Not only that, but we're also embracing space tourism. Whoever would have thought that I could send tourists into space thanks to companies like Blue Canyon. It's amazing. But Leslie hit the real nail on the head. There's an extreme renewed sense of STEM in our younger generations. They are getting excited about space. They're getting excited about science. That's huge. All of that becomes because of the hard work of folks like you in this room and online. Monday night, we talked a little bit about it. I got to watch live as NASA and John Hopkins slammed a satellite into an asteroid in the name of planetary defense. I can remember being a captain and somebody talking about planetary defense and getting laughed out of the room because why would we ever do that? How would we ever do that? We don't have that capability. NASA and John Hopkins proved it on Monday night and it was awesome. The laundry list of accomplishments continues to grow and the capabilities are endless. According to Citibank, the space industry is set to reach $1 trillion in annual revenue by 2040 with launch costs dropping 95% to unlock services from orbit. And the global space economy's value reached $424 billion in 2020, having expanded 70% since 2010. I will stand up here and argue, and I'm not an economist, but I don't think it's gonna take us till 2040 to reach $1 trillion at the level of innovation I see coming out of our industry partners and out of our uh, academic uh, partners. Unfortunately, we've also seen space become even more congested and contested. And initially, I will tell you, we as a nation were slow to respond. We were distracted by what was happening in the Middle East. But I'm proud to tell you, we are seeing a strategic shift across the entire landscape of both uh, DOD, IC, and our international partners. And we are laser focused on countering that rising threat. Secretary Kendall's seven operational imperatives, if you haven't had a chance to follow that, uh, I would recommend you take a look at it because it is going to shift the way the Department of the Air Force, which is the Air Force and Space Force, look at getting after the threat as early as 2024. It is an enormous shift in the way we operate. 
It's going to guarantee through operational uh, imperative number one, which is space order of battle, that we can guarantee that in time of crisis or conflict, our space capabilities will be there without fail. The nation and the warfighter and our allies can absolutely depend on us to be there. It works on how can I buy more time for our national decision makers to avert a crisis. If they don't have the time, it's hard to, for them to get in front of it and to avert a crisis. How can we, through space, buy them more time and more distance in the decision making? We need to guarantee, without a shadow of doubt, that we can, get, that we can deter aggression, and then when deterrence fails, we can win decisively. That's what the operational imperatives are about. And I'll tell you, for the first time in my career, the Joint Warfighter agrees. The Joint Warfighter has come to grips with the fact that they cannot win without space. If you were at AFA last week, uh, there were some enormous, uh, some great speakers, and we also hit record uh, attendance at the AFA with 16,000 attendees uh, in DC. General Van, General Van Herc, the commander of NORTHCOM, stated, you cannot defeat the enemy if you cannot detect it. That's what this conference is all about, space domain awareness. He went on to say, however, what I have seen is about 98% of our domain awareness is left on the cutting room floor and it is not even analyzed. We, everybody in this room, has to correct that. But I'll take you to General Menahan's quote, commander of Air Mobility Command, because he said it best. Lethality matters most. When you can kill your enemy, every part of your life is better. Your, t your food tastes better, your marriage is stronger. <laughs> Overmatch in space starts with space superiority, which starts with space domain awareness. Space domain awareness is foundational to our operations and provides the U.S. and its partners with strategic advantage. It allows us to continuously refine the common operating picture and retain our capability to rapidly characterize, track, and ensure safety of our orbital assets. The days of us focusing only on maintaining the space catalog of knowns is over. And Colonel Brock is here sitting in the front row, and it is his job to move beyond knowing about the knowns and get after what we don't know. With capabilities like Atlas, Osiris, and GSAP, as well as the commercial capabilities that are coming online, not only are we focusing on what we know is up there, we're searching for new objects. We are identifying where those objects came from, why they are there, and what their intents are, as well as, you know what? We know we are capable, without a shadow of a doubt, of being able to defend against those objects if necessary. I will tell you, we still have a long way to go. We must continue to build strong partnerships with our industry partners and, and with academia and our allied partnerships and build agility into our acquisition system, something we've been focused on for a long time. And we must continue to push the limits of research and development. But I'll tell you, capacity alone is not gonna get us to where we've gotta to get to. We've gotta free the data. We have put so many constraints on the data, so many rules on what you can look at, what you can't look at, it, what, what, ha what have you. We've gotta free the data. Without freeing the data, we, we can't get to where General, Herc, General Van Herc's trying to get us past of throwing 95% of, of it on the ground. We need better comm pipes. We are still traveling over the old copper lines that were built back in the 60s. We've got to get past that. We've got to, get, we've got to partner with industry and academia to get a mesh network in space across all orbital regimes to guarantee that that data will continue to flow during crisis and conflict. Then we need better processing. How do I make sense out of all this data? Uh, how do I do uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, et cetera? And I've got to lower the classification level. Space has traditionally been TSSCI, SAP, OMG, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> we've got to stop doing that. All we're doing is hiding from ourselves. We've got to start having the critical conversations and open up the dialogue. In addition, when I stood up SSC, in addition to uh, shifting our PEO focus from delivering systems to actually delivering end-to-end -end capabilities, we also changed our model of acquisitions to a exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build only what we must. Think about those words, exploit what we can, buy, or exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build only what we must. 
It requires a culture change, a culture change that we're in the middle of, not just within acquisitions, but also within operations. Our operators have to know they can count on the commercial data. And I will tell you, you are proving that every single day in places like Ukraine. The data will flow. So we're working on culture change. We're also working on how do I shift resources from that build only what I must bucket, which is where that $11 billion that I was introduced with sits. How do I pull those to the left into the buy what I can or into even better the exploit what we have uh, uh, rim? Uh, we are having conversations with industry like we've never had before. I talked about the industry days. We are fully embracing the dialogue, something we've been scared of our shadow for many, many years because we didn't want to protest, we didn't want a violation of acquisition integrity, what so have you. But by doing that, we weren't having honest and open conversations about the why. Today we're doing that and we're doing it in spades. If you just look at under exploit what we have, that's where our sustainer sweet spot is. They've been pulling off heroics for years, trying to sustain systems without all the resources. We are asking them today, how do I network? How do I integrate in new innovative ways? How do I get more juice from the squeeze? How do I get ready for fight tonight? Because if that book is right and it is 2025, I have to be prepared to protect and defend the capabilities that we have with the systems that we have. How do I get more juice from the squeeze? The real excitement is happening under the buy what we can bucket. There's a lot of synergy that can be gained by optimizing cost, schedule, and performance with overlapping capabilities. By stitching together military, commercially available, and allied capabilities, we can rapidly improve resilience, redundancy, and effectiveness through hybrid solutions. Notice I said commercially available. If I have to pay you to develop it, it is no longer commercially, devail commercially available. And that's a challenge in the dialogue that we continually have. If it's commercially available, we want to learn how to take advantage of it. We stood up the commercial services office uh, to get after weather as a service, comms as a service, and even space domain awareness as a service. Over the past couple of years, we spent $134 million on space domain awareness. In commercial services alone, I think we're going to exceed a billion to two billion within the next year to two across the entire commercial services office. But we didn't just stop there. We're looking at how do I do dual use technology, something that was developed in the medical field. How do I apply it to space? How do I apply automotive? How do I apply cell phone technologies? What are those dual use technologies that we can take advantage of today? How can I take advantage of commercial ride shares? There's an enormous amount of capability going into orbit by our commercial partners. How can I collaborate and start doing commercial ride shares? But we didn't just stop with commercial. We started talking with our international uh, uh, allies stood up the SSCIA and just opened up the dialogue wide. The U.S. is continuing to build partnerships with nations who share our commitment to on-orbit safety and the ethical use of space. We are regularly updating our sharing agreements and expanding the circle of users who share our space domain awareness data. Together, we are all stronger. That takes us to the, the build what we must bucket. That's our sweet spot, that's what we're good at. For years, we've delivered the, the, the world's most technological uh, capabilities on space. Uh, we have the greatest launch uh, uh, complex, launch industry, greatest SATCOM, greatest missile warning, uh, PNT, the entire world depends on GPS. And we've delivered things like GSAP, a neighborhood cop, to understand what's actually going on in the neighborhood and to report on the activities that they're seeing. At the nexus of buy what we can and build what we must is tactically responsive space. We have spent a lot of time admiring the problem of how to be responsive in space. Industry has gotten us there with, by pushing the cost of launch down, by miniaturizing the electronics, we can now and have proven now that we can get to tactically responsive space. Space domain awareness is foundational to the U.S. operations. The Space Systems Command's tactically responsive space program, Victus Knox, is a tool that will help us help us to continue to ensure SDA capabilities in, on orbit. If you were tracking TACRS, uh, or TACRL to Odyssey's launch in, in June of 2021 as part of our first tactically responsive space mission, demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that Space Systems Command's ability to rapidly develop, acquire, and field space domain awareness systems that are resilient, tactically responsive, and operationally relevant. 
Our next TAC RS uh, space mission leverages Odyssey's lessons learned and takes us to the next step in this capabilities development with Victus Knox by setting a goal of condensing the launch call up period from weeks to 24 hours. What we have challenged that team to do and what I am seeing them uh, demonstrate the ability to do is to rapidly respond to a real threat with an operational capability using operational crews on operationally relevant timelines. Within 24 hours, they can bring a satellite and a launch vehicle together, made it, encapsulate it, launch it, and put it into operations all within 24 hours. And they're gonna demonstrate that next summer. We are done admiring the problem and, getting, and we are getting after the combatant command's need to truly protect and defend the peaceful use of space. In closing, it's a great time to be in space. There has been a literal explosion in innovation and forums like this help to keep that dialogue flowing and help us get towards unity of effort. We have something that the adversary doesn't have and we continue to prove it. First thing we have is the innovation coming out of our academia and our industry partners. They have come to our rescue during every conflict in the history of the United States and of our allies. We also have partnerships that we're proving in Ukraine today. Our allies are there by our side and we are by their side. Together, we are all stronger. But the thing that we really have that they don't have are our people. And a renewed sense of STEM is exciting. It is my honor to be here today with you and it is my honor to serve by your side. Semper Super.